and welcome back right we're going to have a quick update now of the uh, wireless rain receiver which you're looking at right here and um, it's all done finished put to bed really although of course the coding you could say will never be finished because you could always think of new stuff to put in here but um, at the moment it's been working for I don't know what a couple of weeks maybe and when I say working I mean the primary user of this device yes the dearly beloved has used this to good effect and she's had no complaints so it must be working well there is one tiny shortcoming that won't be made known until next year and we'll just mention that in passing as we go through it so let's turn it on and uh, we'll talk about the case and how it all went together right switching it on and rain detection system operational rain is now being monitored Benny thanks you and remember Benny is the best cat ever okay there we are then now it all works you've probably seen that before if you've looked at uh, the videos that sort of explained all this and went through it in some detail videos 46 that was the transmitter um, 48 was the receiver but it wasn't in this nice little box so let's talk about this box why did I buy it because it was make no mistake about it quite expensive so the box cost about uh, 11 pounds plus a little bit of postage as well from a UK supplier so it wasn't the cheapest box in the world but as I said because I wanted it in a home environment you know the standard project box with four screws and four feet just wasn't going to cut the mustard really so I decided to splash out just a little bit and have this little device now where did I get it from let's have a look on the browser right so it's from eBay it was from the UK right so it's £10.99 plus postage so it wasn't cheap um, but you can get it in black or white and I chose black because it sort of blends in a little bit with the uh, the telly well I say the telly where the the television and the digi box and all that exists this blends in rather well when it's black um, white I think would be more in keeping I don't know in a bedroom perhaps I don't know whatever anyway I chose black and um, oh yes now there are some configurations here that you might well be interested in the cutouts that you can have um, it's out of stock it says but you can have the cutouts in the side for the Uno or for an Uno and Mega and LAN shield and what they do basically on the on the bits and pieces that this comes in um, there are holes in the side or it might be this side actually where the cutouts are like this cutout here I put that in for a, a special USB socket that I wanted on there so I could plug it in to change the code without having to take the thing apart because it's only held together by friction so if you look very closely at it you can see where these joints here just sort of push in and it is a reasonably tight fit it won't fall apart just by standing there but it's not the same as a screwed and glued case so I'm not going to take this apart every two minutes just to change the code hence the USB socket on the side here so I can plug it in change the code if I have to and uh, no damage done to the device itself so the full description of all that is in that video as I've just said so I'm not going to go for that, all through that again but um, there's the little um, touch switch so if you hold that it beeps and then says off on the front this looks very washed out on camera I might add it's lovely deep blue I think it's the um, the auto lighting of the camera that does all that um, so I'm going to try and just change my lighting and see if we can see if we can get that down a bit right I've turned the brightness down the camera just so you can get a much better idea of what it um, looks like in real life it still doesn't quite do it justice but it's it's better than it was this is um, a very deep blue this uh, this color I think I might have mentioned that before but you get an idea of what it is so um, if I touch that little thing on the top it goes beep and it's back on again and at the moment there's no rain and the relative humidity is 64 incidentally it's surprising what difference this humidity makes to the the general heat feeling or mugginess feeling it might only be 21 22 but if the humidity is up to sort of the 80 percent it feels really hot and muggy clammy you know just as an aside perhaps i'm turning into a weatherman um right so that's that's what it looks like in real life and whilst i was building all this into this unit here i did actually 
make some take some pictures I didn't take a video it had taken far too long um, but I did take some pictures and I'll talk you through those in case you're interested in doing something similar even if it's nothing to do with this project itself the fact that this case does um, well it's custom made for this 16 by 4 LCD and they do another one for um sorry that was a 20 by 4 and they do another one for a 16 by 2 which um, I've also sort of lodged in the back of my mind just in case one day I'm going to need something like that again. Incidentally, I've just noticed, I was just having this thing at the back here running with this flashing LED. Have you noticed how the colours are um, coming through a lot better since I've turned down the, um, well, both the auto white balance and the brightness? Look, they're actually coming through as green, red and blue. The blue's still a little bit bright, but um, apart from that, it's looking a lot better. I'll have to bear that in mind for future videos. Okay, well, I'm going to have to turn the brightness back up now if we're going to see anything else at all. And uh, then we'll just talk it through. All right, bear with me. Right, here we are again, back to normal exposure and everything else. Um, right, so I'm going to talk through the photographs. One thing this, this box does give you, though... Oh, incidentally, on the, um, the website, uh, where I bought it from, let's just have a, another look at that. Um, it does mention that um, you have to be a little bit wary of the um, stuff it's made of. Was it Perspex, I think? Um, but I found no trouble at all. The bit of advice I could give you is, if you're going to drill it, drill it very slowly. Only let the drill do the work. Don't never push it like you would say with um, wood. You can just let the weight of the drill make the hole. Um, and not too slowly and not too fast. You don't want it to melt the plastic. So here it tells you all about it, how it's you know, going to fit together and things. So if you're interested in this sort of thing, uh, read that. And they do give you full colour um, assembly instructions. Because all this, this, this entire stuff, all comes as a couple of sheets of um, protected perspex. It's got like backing paper on it. You'll see it in the photos. Um, but as you can see, I've managed to drill all these holes out the back here for the um, speaker and one for the beeper. No trouble at all. And this back piece does actually come off. So if I lift up their little catches, look. So this one now, I'm going to unplug it actually. There we are. Just to avoid any possible mishaps. So this, now I've lifted that up, there's nothing holding this side in. So now you can just lift it out gently. I'm being very gently here. Right, so there's the, uh, the innards. Now I'm not going to go through all this because you'll see this on the photographs. But it's all quite tight in there. And if I had to do it again, would I do it differently? Yes. I wouldn't have this USB socket here. It's just too big and clunky for a case this size. For a, a bigger box, that would have been ideal. But um, as I said, I did want something so I could plug it in and program it without having to take the back off. Because you imagine trying to now take that nano out from in there and try and program it. It would be a hell's game. So it works, but it's just too big. I would have had to choose a different type of socket. They do a, a USB... B socket, that's the square sort of socket, the things you find on the back of printers. That might have been a better fit actually, but even that is far too big. What you really want is a micro USB type socket. And uh, they, I haven't been able to find one basically, not even in China. So that's as far as I'm going to disassemble it. I'll show you the photographs, talk you through it on the photographs and call it a day. Um, now I'm going to have to put that together again. As I say, only it's only a push fit and then a slide down. And then uh, we'll just leave that quietly alone. OK, watch the photographs and we'll come back and we'll talk about some other stuff. Right, see you in a bit. So here you see it with the front panel already sort of installed with the LCD screwed into place. There's a sideways view. All that white stuff incidentally is just protected paper. And there's the inside view with the LCD screwed in and the USB socket, which as you can see is a bit of a tight fit, isn't it really? And there's all the other bits that somehow got to fit in there. There are two beepers there, of course, we're only using one of them, the round one as it happened, but at the time I didn't know. So there's the uh, strip board down the bottom now with the nano sort of half installed. There it is again with the wiring done and the MP3 player. That's the speaker just held in with some of that uh, hot glue. Um, I've written the uh, pins down the side of the headers there just to make sure things line up correctly and colour coded the board a little bit as well. It all helps when you're putting things together. So there's a view of it more or less completed and there it is running. Look at that. It looks um, really nice. I'm glad I spent the money on the professional case really because I think it does 
add something. There's the speaker holes at the rear. It doesn't really matter. They're not circular. You're not going to see those. And there's the USB socket on the side. I reckon that's okay. There's a front view. Now, so the problems then we um, had. Look at that. There's the corrosion for the uh, rain sensor. Uh, it's that green yucky stuff you get from batteries and all that. And the underneath as well. So that's just not going to cut the mustard, is it? So I've cleaned it up there now, taken all that corrosion off. Made it all nice and shiny again. But uh, we really have got to stop that somewhere. I've moved it as well so we can clean it every day. But that is pretty much it. Now, so that sort of puts this project to bed. But there was, there was some deficiency, as I say, with that... Um, corroded rain sensor and the reason why it corrodes is because if you can imagine it's got I'll draw this an exaggerated motor you've got various fingers like this haven't you on one side and then on the other side you've got fingers within those all connected up to the other side so that's that's what plugs in to the sensor all well and good and of course what it's relying on is that a blob of water across those decreases the resistance at that point or possibly the capacitance who knows what it does um, so that it can be detected and it works very well for what it is unfortunately of course it's working on dc so what's happening down this um, part of the sensor down here is that we're probably getting something like a square wave being generated i don't know how often i've put it on a scope and it makes no odds really but the fact we're putting this dc down here as soon as we get a rain blob like that current is going to pass between the two fingers here and therefore between here so fine it can detect it but that that pulse then allows current to travel through here obviously and that then creates the corrosion between these fingers and if you're going to get blobs all over this in time which we'll do in a rainstorm of course so it stays wet for a period now whether that's you know 10 minutes or an hour or four hours what it allows is corrosion to start appearing between these little fingers. A bit like if you've ever taken out a very old battery from a, a transistor radio or something, you, can, you know what state sometimes the contacts can be there, sort of green-white corrosion. And that's pretty much what's happening here, for a different reason, but the same sort of thing. It oxidises and you get the corrosion across the fingers. And the reason is because it's a DC current. If we were to have an AC current flowing through there, all right, so that's the zero line. An AC current creates corrosion on one half, but then takes away the corrosion on the other, so you don't get any corrosion with an AC sensor. So, of course, I could invest the time and effort to try and make the sensor work or devise my own sensor with an AC voltage supply, but there's another option that I'm looking into now, having looked it up on the internet, and it's this. In my car, and possibly yours too, we have an automatic rain sensor for the windscreen wipers. And the way they work, apparently, I've read it up, you have your infrared transmitter here. It bounces it up towards the windscreen, which is something like a 45 degree angle. This is probably all done behind the rear view mirror on your windshield. So it transmits rays of infrared light up to the windshield, which then deflects them back into a receiver and that's obviously what's being detected and we could do the same with the Arduino. In fact the Arduino modules where you have a transmitter and a detector is exactly what you use in you know robotic cars and whatnot and that's fine. But with a glass reflector like this yes I guess some of the light will, will exit through the glass but enough gets reflected back to have a, a steady and reliable source to detect that you have what you expect to come back. Now, if you suddenly have a blob of water on the windscreen, so this is this is now water, hugely magnified, a tiny little drop, what happens is that more light then get diffracted out like that, and it bends the light a bit like that, a bit like putting this stick or this pen into a glass of water where you're looking sideways through it. It would tend to bend, wouldn't it, at a funny angle. We've all seen that as school kids. And that's the diffraction of light through a liquid. And that's what happens on windscreens, apparently. The infrared light hits the windshield, would normally be bounced back, but this blob of water in here changes the diffraction of that windshield and allows it to escape. So you get far less coming back here, which then this detector and us via the Arduino can detect. So I'm going to look into that because if I can get that to work, 
for my rain sensor outside, then that is a 100% win, isn't it? And of course, it gives me something to do through the cold winter nights. So I'm going to try this. I've got one of these modules for the Arduino where you have a transmitter and a receiver anyway for um, robotics, cars or whatever. So I can use that or I've got separate ones. So we'll see what I come up with over the following weeks. But that would be a real win. So that's what I'm going to try. Um, I'm also looking at um, the coding for an LED cube, but not an 8x8. We're looking at the principles behind an LED cube and why it works and why it's not quite so difficult as you might think. It's just a little bit fiddly, you know, it's just arduous getting all the code in, or at least the patterns that you want to show on the cube. But uh, I can show you all that, and in fact I intend to show you all that because I think it'd be quite interesting to get something running. Right, I think we've sort of reached the end of this video. We've run out of time yet again. So we're going to put this rain sensor to bed. We've learnt quite a few things on it. Uh, so I think it's been a pretty good project and uh, it's been well received downstairs. So win-win all round, I reckon. Yeah, kudos. Right, OK. That um, flashing light, by the way, at the back of my desk, that's just still the sound to light thing I've got rigged up there. Um, and it just works so wonderfully well. I just like looking at it. And of course, it picks up my voice just great. And really, that's what I'm doing. I'm testing you know, how it reacts to music, how it reacts to voice. It works better again with dimmed light. In fact, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a, a 15 second demo of this when the lights are dim. So let me just change my camera down to programmable and I'm going to reduce the lighting on it. So let's see if I can just find that exposure. There we are. There we are. Down, down, down. Right. So now hopefully you can see that the colours are a bit more pronounced. The red looks like a red. The green looks like a green. The blue is still a little bit white, but then again, I think blue LEDs are very bright, aren't they? So, and as I mentioned last time, um, this code only lights up one of the colours at a time. Whatever's next in sequence gets an equal shot at being lit so that we don't try and light up all three colours at once, otherwise it just looks like a white mess, basically. But this way, as you can see, it's going red, green and blue in, in some sort of random sequence. But I don't know if it's random. Is it random? Who knows? Probably. But on a Christmas tree project, which has arrived, by the way, so I'm going to build that next. Um, it's arrived, and I'll be using not red, green, blue. I'll be using these standard ones. You can just see these at the back. Look, the yellow, red, and green LEDs with a similar circuit to this, where we don't have to worry about lighting just one up. We can light all three up if we want at the same time. And you probably saw that in one of the previous recent videos. So that'll be on the cards too. Right, must stop talking. We've done enough. Thanks so much for watching. Remember to spread the word. Give me a thumbs up and uh, subscribe if you haven't already because there's loads more stuff coming up. Okay, thanks for watching. See you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. Please leave comments down below. Subscribe, share and give me a thumbs up. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.